Okay, we are live. So hello everyone and uh, welcome to today's event in the ISTVS uh, digital event series. I am Massimo Martelli and I am a researcher at the National Research Council of Italy and the General Secretary of ISTVS. Our weekly series alternates between presentations by established researchers and informal student-led research seminars. And today we have a student research seminar on reduced order modeling of granular intrusions with continuum and empirical approaches. Our speaker today is uh, Shashank Agarwal from the Cameron Group at MIT in Boston. Uh, before we start, our usual uh, quick request. So uh, in the sidebar on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, look for sessions and under sessions, look for the chat tab. And please drop in a short intro with your location, affiliation, and your research interests. Um, you'll also see a tab called Q&A where you can type questions for, uh, for our speaker. And after the presentation, we will have an open conversation. So we will ask you to click the blue button at the top right to share your audio and video and join the live conversation. And once you click the button, a moderator uh, will admit you to the live stage. So now, hi, Shashank. And uh, we're looking forward uh, to hearing about your work and I'll leave it to you. Thanks, Massimo. Uh, I'll share my screen. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, it's fine. In the presentation. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for the quick introduction and thanks a lot for inviting me uh, to this uh, session and giving me the opportunity to present my work. Uh, so hello all, I'm Shashank. I'm a graduate student in mechanical engineering department at MIT. I work with Professor Ken Cameron. Uh, and most of the work that I'm presenting today is done with my advisor and our collaborators uh, at Georgia Tech in Professor uh, Goldman's group. I'll, I'll give a proper acknowledgement and what everyone has done towards the end of this presentation. Uh, so I understand I come from a slightly different background than yours. So at any point of time, if you feel uh, my presentation is going too fast, too slow, or if you have some comments, if something is not clear, feel free to interrupt or you can put it in the chat and Massimo, you can let me know. Uh, and I'll be happy to change the pace of my uh, uh, presentation just to make things more clear and a better transfer of uh, knowledge from my side. So with that, I'll start. Um, I have fairly small presentation. I have like 30 slides, so we should be fine on time. Um, so, okay, I'll start. Uh, so I'm gonna present on reduced order modeling of granular intrusions with a continuum and empirical approach. So uh, this is the overall outline of my presentation. Uh, uh, we'll start with uh, reviewing the granular intrusion research and what we specifically focus on when it comes to the granular intrusion as such, and what philosophy we are following when solving these kind of problems. Second is I'll go into introduction of kind of uh, different numerical approaches I use in my research, uh, namely discrete element modeling, uh, continuum modeling, and empirical modeling called resistive force theory, which is also the primary focus of my research. And then I'll talk about extending RFT in different uh, direction and what we have achieved over last uh, five years. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the general introduction of the topic of uh, granular intrusion. So if you think about mobility and ground-based transportation, it's one of the cornerstones of human civilization. And uh, among the mobility, the ground transportation has been the most important. Uh, and if you think about over the years of centuries, uh, we have came from time when we were using uh, animals to drive our uh, vehicles or uh, carts. And now we are talking about autonomous vehicles which can drive themselves uh, uh, in, in very proper roads and very high speeds. But when it comes to the performance of same vehicles in natural terrains, they are not performing at their best. And its limitation is the limitations are not limited to Earth, but continues on other planets like Mars and Moon. So that's what I focus on. So now if we talk about the granular intrusion, the, uh, the fact that uh, or the scenario of motion of vehicles in sand, it can it's, it's not limited to vehicles. The granular intrusion itself is, is very common in nature, in natural and man-made settings. 
uh, for example, in ground-based mobility applications, as we already talked about, uh, animal locomotion, and also in industrial processes uh, such as steering and mixing, granular intrusion is extremely common. And in such situations, the interest often lies in modeling the motion of objects in terms of finding forces on them and modeling how they will move and what kind of efforts are required uh, to move these objects rather than understanding the flow of material in, in some of the application, not always. Uh, so if you think about this kind of a scenario where a v vehicle or a bike is moving in sand, uh, there are two ways of approaching it or there are two uh, aspects to it. One is modeling the flow of material which requires tracking millions and trillions of particles. And second is finding forces on intruders without focusing on the sand itself or granular material itself, which is uh, a problem limited by its size of the intruder and the defining surfaces. And that's what I focus on. Uh, because this problem has the chances of large uh, uh, computational time cost reductions. So in, in short, my PhD goal is to develop methods for modeling forces on objects moving in granular materials, such as sand, at extremely low computational cost. And the aim is to come up with methods which can do it almost in real time. Now, the approach is we try to understand the physics of generation of forces, and then we try to develop empirical models which can incorporate that physics uh, and model the forces acting on objects without having to model the sand itself. So, and the applications, as I said, is are um, primarily in real-time path planning on Earth as well as other extraterrestrial applications, uh, but are not limited to that. It can also be used for intruder shape optimization. For example, if you want to develop anchors which work better in sand or want to make robots which work better in sand, for all those kind of applications, uh, this work applies to, is, is useful. So uh, when we talk about empirical model, uh, there are existing methods in the field of tire mechanics, which most of you know much better than me, uh, but they are often shape specific. For example, Becker model and all. Uh, they can be modified to make to work for, uh, let's say, for example, tank and other kind of uh, scenarios, but they are not like general at their core. Uh, and that's what I focus on. So we primarily focus on a theory called resistive force theory. The theory in its current form applies to non-cohesive materials. Uh, in quasi-static limits, and it follows something called hydrodynamic decoupling and superposition of forces. I'll talk about what they mean. And the basic uh, form of theory is like this. So let's say you have an object. I'll start using my pointer. Uh, so let's say you have an object which was initially here, and it decided to move from here to here as a function of its current uh, state. Uh, so the way uh, this particular scenario is modeled is we discretize the object into small, small sub uh, line elements. And for each of these line elements, we find the angle of inclination, direction of velocity, as well as depth and the area. Once we have these parameters, we use a functional form, which, which is the core of RFT, to find the net force on the body. Once we have net force on that subsurface, we integrate it uh, over the complete body to find the net force on the body. It can also be integrated to find the moments and other things. And the reason we use uh, the word hydrodynamic decoupling and superposition of forces is because we say that forces vary linearly in the depth and they follow superposition, that the forces on individual surfaces are independent of others and they can be summed up to find the net force on the body. Now, interestingly, this angle, uh, the function alpha, which represents force per unit depth per unit area, has this kind of a form where C is a, a fitting parameter and alpha is a generic value of uh, force per unit area per unit depth and it comes out that most of the non-cohesive granular materials follow the exact same form of alpha so once you have these graphs which are now available in literature for last five ten years uh, you can you just need to know the value of c coefficient and if you have a non-cohesive granular material and it's moving slowly you can just use this form to find the net force on a body over time so this is a sample RFP simulation uh, implemented in MATLAB, uh, where basically we, are, we take a wheel shape, apply a rotational velocity, and the velocity is on the eight, every subsurface. It is represented with blue arrows, uh, sorry, with red arrows. And as a function of its motion, it experiences forces which are shown in blue, and the whole simulation happens almost in real time. So my overall research objective was to develop methods for modeling uh, various uh, granular intrusion scenarios. So the approach is to uh, modify RFT 
to model complex control intuitions. And it should include macro enriched effects, which means the effects related to motion of objects at high speed, micro enriched effects, that is the effects associated with change in material properties when the objects move at high speed, three dimensional dependence, because the form of RFT I showed you is in two dimension, multi body effects uh, in the sense that when multiple bodies move in the sand at the same time, how does their force response uh, change as a uh, result of presence of other body? Media property effects, for example, density variation. What if the density of the, the material has the property of existing in different densities, cohesion, etc. And our approach is the experimental and uh, full field numerical simulations to understand the physics and then incorporate that into our um, form of RFT that I showed you earlier. Now, the, most of the experiments in our work is done by our collaborators at Georgia Tech. And uh, the way we use these experiments is primarily for verification purposes. So we use continuum modeling. We try to understand the physics. At the same time, just to make sure that our simulations make sense, we use the experiment for verifications. Now, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the computational methods uh, for understanding the physics. The first one is discrete element method. Most of you must be familiar with this method. In this method, the grains are uh, modeled at granular level. So particle-particle contacts are modeled. Uh, uh, and then the second method that we is also one of the uh, sub focus of my PhD is the Mises scale modeling, where we use continuum modeling to describe uh, 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 the grain as a media. When I say continuum modeling, which we say that the grains do not have a particle nature, they can be explained with a uh, continual differential equation uh, in its form. So I'll go into a little bit more details about continuum modeling. Uh, these are like some of the representations of the constitutive models we use in our study, uh, just to give an, uh, a basic feel of what kind of models we are talking about. So for example, if you look at this model, basically what we are saying is, if you compress on the media, it will try to resist because of the spring part. Whereas if you pull on it, it will just fall apart. It cannot support any stress because of the spring starter kind of a uh, representation. And the third one is reduced order modeling uh, RFT, which I already talked about. And the advantage, each of these methods have their advantage. The first one is extremely accurate. It's uh, used at a very large scale in the industry. But the issue with that is uh, these methods are extremely expensive in terms of computation time. The second method is one of the focus of my PhD has relatively smaller computational time. They give a major scale understanding of the system. When I say major scale, it means we are looking at systems at much larger uh, length scales than uh, the particle itself. And we are looking at the variation of stresses and strains in the system at a, at a higher uh, point of view. And the last one is uh, RFT, which is extremely fast and it's completely macro scale, but uh, improving its accuracy is one of the focus of my PhD. A uh, little bit more about discrete element method. Uh, Particle particle contacts are uh, modeled using uh, hooky and contact based. Uh, you know, formulation. Uh, we don't develop these methods. We use the standard packages called lamps and lights. Uh, for most of these simulations, we do not uh, assume any deformation in the part, sorry, any breaking of the particles. So the contacts are always in elastic limit. So the stresses are not very high, which is expected when it comes to granular intuitions because they are nearby the free surface. As I said, they like measure scale. So we use continuum modeling. So assuming some of you might not have a background in continuum modeling, I'll, I'll go uh, from a much basic level. So in continuum modeling, the media is considered as a continuum and we assume particles do not act like individuals and they act like a chunk of material uh, acting together. So the density, uh, the media itself can be described using continuum, uh, continuous stress and displacement fields itself. And at any point of time, those stress field and strain uh, the displacement fields uh, follow the momentum balance equation, where sigma represents the stress tensor and V dot represents the acceleration, which directly relates to the displacement field. And uh, the relation between sigma and displacement field is decided by the constitutive laws. For example, for sand, this constitutive law will be different. For elastic body, it will be completely different. And if you talk, talk about the continuum modeling of uh, granular materials, uh, it, it the basic philosophy is like this. So granular media have this property that they can act like a solid as well as they can flow. Now, in the simplest non-cohesive rate insensitive con constant density granular media, the ratio between the shear stress, which is represented by tau bar, and the hydrostatic pressure, 
uh, decides the transition between the two phases. If you are below this, uh, below a certain value of this ratio, you act like a solid uh, body. On the other hand, if you are at that value, you start to flow. Where tau bar represents the debitory part of stress and the uh, P represents the hydrostatic pressure. So I won't go into the details of these things to avoid uh, unnecessary confusion here. Uh, and mu is a property which is called the internal coefficient of friction of the media. Now, uh, on a tau bar versus P diagram, where tau is the shear strength and P is the, sorry, shear, equivalent shear stress and P is the hydrostatic pressure at any point of time or any space, any time and space point in the media, uh, the relation would look some something like this, that if you are below this line, you are elastic solid. If you are on this line, you are basically flowing. Now, uh, as we know, the granular materials are not so simple as we have experienced in our researches. Uh, they can have cohesion. They can have density variation, uh, show the phenomena of Reynolds dilation and contraction, which is related to rearrangement of particles to different packing fractions. Uh, they can also show crushing of grains at high pressures. Uh, they can show rate effects because of the fluctuation of particles when the uh, motions are done at very high speeds. They can have like damage dependent cohesion. There are models like jo Johnson, uh, Johnson Homepost model and all. Uh, so these kind of uh, complexities can uh, alter the form of <coughs> sorry, tau bar versus P relation that I talked about earlier. So in those cases, this line, which is the yield surface, changes. For example, if you have cohesion, uh, the shear strength of the material uh, becomes non-zero at non-zero uh, at zero value of pressure. Similarly, if the material exists at different density states, the there are different yield surfaces corresponding to different state of the material. Similarly, there are other cap models which say that there is a limit to which the material can have hydrostatic pressure, and if it is more than that, then the material will follow slightly different uh, constitutive model or different parameters. So. Uh, this was like a very high level uh, introduction to uh, continuum modeling of granular materials. But in more formal way, this is the kind of implementation we do. That let's say this is the tau versus P graph, uh, the basic constitutive model that I talked about. Uh, the overall strain in the system is divided into elastic and plastic part. We make use of something called a flow rule, which relates the plastic part uh, of the flow, which currently uh, kind of represents the flow of the material with the stresses, which depend on the elastic part of the overall strain. And by using these internal constraints, we forward march in the time by uh, by evaluating the stresses at uh, future time steps. And as the complexity of these constraint models increase, the dependencies also increase. The flow rules increase, uh, the sorry, flow rules evolve as well as the dependence of the like, internal frictions and all change. Now, uh, so for implementing this particular, uh, these kind of uh, models, we use something called a material point method. This method was developed uh, by Selsky et al. in 1994. Uh, and basically what we are doing here is we are representing the chunk of material using material markers, which are also called material points. So in this simulation, all the points kind of things that you are seeing there, oh, Oh, the, all the points kind of representation you are thing, seeing are not grains, but they represent a chunk of material around them. And then we use a background grade to do the calculation of forces. I'll go into slight details of this next. So at any point of time, let's say you have a, a media, which would be sand, it could be elastic body or anything else. It's represented using these Lagrangian material markers. And basically what they are doing is they carry the state of the material on them. Uh, so this is like an approximation of the body. Uh, when I say the state, it contains the stress, strain, mass, momentum, everything which is which uh, lives on, uh, which lives as a property of those materials. At the starting of any time step, we identify the grid nodes which these points can project their properties on, and uh, we project the properties onto those grid points. And when I say properties, I'm talking about stresses, momentum, mass, and everything, and body forces in that. Then what we do is we do momentum balance to find the expected strain or the acceleration of the object uh, on these uh, grid nodes. And in the next step, we project it back onto the material points. So uh, all we did in these three steps is we started with the state of the material in terms of stress and uh, body forces. And we found out the expected strain as a function of normal moment balance equation. Once we have that, we find uh, the strain as a result of this particular motion over that time step. 
And once we have the strain in the system, or basically strain rate, uh, because we are using strain is basically the multiple strain increment is basically the multiplication of strain rate with the time. Uh, we can use the constitutive laws that I talked about earlier to find the stress in the next step. Once we have stress, we again go back to the first step and start projecting and forward marching in time. So this was like a basic introduction of the continuum modeling uh, method we use. Uh, so coming back to uh, quasi-static RFT, uh, I said the quasi-static RFT uh, works for uh, um, non cursive granular materials at low speed. So I started my research uh, by focusing on the fact that RFT is a great way of modeling granular intrusions when the objects are moving at slow speeds. So the, in this work that we published in 2019, we showed that whether the weeds are circular, grousard, or any other shape, they can model granular, intru uh, granular intrusion, especially locomotion to high accuracy as per the industry norms. And it works not, in, not only for simple shapes, but even for complicated shapes like these flap fields where you can see the sinkage and torque variations over time uh, pretty accurately with RFT. RFT is shown by red lines. After doing that, uh, uh, one of the uh, limitations of quasi-static RFT is it's quasi-static. That, that means it does not work for high speeds. Uh, one of the example is locomotion of wheels. So think about this wheel moving at different uh, angular speeds in sand. You might have experienced this, that if you go in desert and start moving at high speed, uh, you start to slip which can be shown by this graph, by this blue line, which is the which represents the experiments done by our collaborators, uh, that the velocity versus RPM graph has uh, turnover. Our continuum modeling was able to uh, capture this phenomena. Uh, this line should be black. So the total time which uh, circles uh, shows the continuum results. And if we use RFT, the form of RFT I showed you earlier, it, it will be a line, straight line like this. So it cannot capture the turnover of this graph and that the reason is the form of RFT that I showed you earlier is rate magnitude in, uh, insensitive. So it does not consider the velocity magnitude in its form. So we, uh, so on this side, we had a phenomena in which the motion of uh, objects at high speeds <coughs> result into reduced strength of the media. And that's the reason we are experiencing less attraction. On the other hand, we thought about these kind of uh, phenomena in which if you take plates and move it into sand at high speeds, the force or the drag force on them increase uh, quadratically. So basically, uh, on one side, you have reduced traction from the sand. In second case, you have high traction in the sand at high velocities. So we developed something called a dynamic RFT. So this equation kind of shows two years of my work. And what we came up with the idea was uh, the overall uh, uh, response of any granular material at high speed can be modeled with slow speed RFT by these two modifications. The first one is dynamic structural correction, which happens because when uh, uh, when objects move at high speed in sand, they cause some of the material to lose contact with each other, which causes the free surface on the backside of the wheel uh, to become lesser. So this is basically uh, happening because the material in this region does not have contact with each other. So it cannot support any stress. And so it's almost like it's not there. So the actual effective free surface height on the back side of the wheel decreases. And this causes the wheel to experience lesser force in the forward direction. The other component is the conventional rho v square macro inertia effect, uh, macro inertia component, which is required for imparting uh, higher and higher inertia to the sand in front of any object moving in sand at high speeds, uh, because it has to be accelerated to a higher velocity at higher um, intrusion rates. With this concept, we were able to capture a variety of granular intrusion phenomena. Uh, one of them was wheel locomotion. Um, so we were able to capture the turnover of uh, velocity as well as increase in sinkage at higher RPMs. Uh, we were able to capture the phenomena of um, increase in drag forces on plates at high velocities. And the last one, we were also able to capture the phenomena of uh, acceleration or you can say the decreased slip in these kind of peculiar wheels which although look like grousered wheel but act like plates in the sense that uh, as the rpm on them is increased they start moving at velocities higher than r omega our form of drft was able to capture this phenomenon so with this we were able to extend our rft to high speeds but the question was it all it's all in uh, 2d so what about if the uh, actual phenomena is happening in three dimension so for that 
uh, we developed a three dimension uh, three dimensional form of RFT, which is basically an extension of um, RFT uh, that I showed you earlier to three dimension, where uh, uh, instead of a line element, we talk about a plate element, and each plate element is um, characterized using its normal component, its velocity component, uh, velocity direction component, um, its depth, and the area. By using these uh, four uh, parameters, you can find forces on individual plates by using the form as I showed you earlier. And the form of alpha again takes the same form as last time. There's a scaling coefficient and there's a generic value. And the net value on the uh, object can be obtained by superposition of forces on all the subsurfaces. Uh, while developing this form, there, uh, we needed a uh, little bit more caution than 2D RFT. And the reason was that when you talk about the motion of plates in three dimension, it experiences a lot of symmetries, which are usually not present in 2D RFT. For example, if you talk about this plate motion moving in sand at a particular inclined uh, with respect to x direction uh, in the velocity shown by the blue direction, uh, blue arrow here, and if you uh, it experience the force f here. Now, if you take the same plate configuration and rotate it by certain angle theta along z axis in such a way that the plate as well as velocity rotates by same angle by theta, uh, the force magnitude does not change. And that's because there is no preferential direction of x or y direction when it comes to the plate intrusions. Similarly, if you talk about this kind of motion, when a plate is equally inclined with respect to horizontal, uh, you don't expect any force in out of plane direction, in this case, in theta direction. The other constraints, for example, if you take uh, a plate, incline it at a certain angle, and move down. And if you start rotating it, then all the forces are correlated to each other by simple this cos and sine theta of each other, which is similar to the cylindrical symmetry I showed you earlier. So these are some of the constraints, but even more constraints are required when it comes to uh, developing 3D RFT. So we consider all those constraints and come up with a form of 3D RFT. Uh, for generating data, we again use continuum modeling uh, in three dimensions. Uh, and with that, we come up with a form of RFT. Uh, in order to show the results, I'm going to show this kind of uh, graphs where we are plotting forces in x, y, and z directions as a function of theta. So we are using different values of theta. And as a function of theta, we are plotting these f forces. So in this case, uh, we take a sphere, move it at different theta directions, and measure the forces in x, y, and z direction. So that's. Uh, Circles show the reference solution, and the dotted line show the RFT results. Sorry, 3D RFT results. Uh, circle, ellipsoid, uh, cubes, uh, oblique cubes, which are not symmetric. In all these cases, RF 3D RFT works with a great accuracy. This is a work in preparation. So we are now trying to understand, can we model even more complicated shapes? For example, this bunny, which is a standard bunny shape used in uh, graphic community. This simulation took like 4,000 uh, CPU hours. And the idea is, can uh, RFT, which takes hardly 40 seconds to do the same simulations, can model all the forces on different surfaces of the body? So this is the work which I'm, like, I'm still working on. Uh, and the results are not in a state to uh, share here. Uh, now, coming back to the initial question, we were talking about uh, developing something uh, we were trying to develop RFT into something which is more general. So we talked about macro material in effect, that three dimensional dependence and all. But the multi body effects or the density variation effects or cohesion in the media still remains to be addressed. So I'm almost completing my PhD, so I don't have sufficient time to work on all of these topics. But I have worked on developing tools which the future researchers can use to further extend RFT. So the kind of consumer models that I showed you earlier, they were like part of our, one of the publications, which talks about how these two models can be used to model variety of granular intrusions, which are beyond uh, what RFT can do. So one of the example is multi-body uh, intrusions. So let's say you take two plates and move them horizontally into the sand and measure the vertical force acting on them. And now what you do is you measure this force as a function of separation between the plates. It is interesting phenomena that the plates experience a peak in the force uh, at an optimal distance between them. So far, people used to believe that this phenomena cannot be captured with continuum modeling, and it's it has to do with particle size effects. 
uh, but we were able to uh, explain why this phenomena happens and also able to come up with the scaling laws which can be used for characterizing such things so the overall idea is if someone in the future wants to understand multi-body effects they have this constraint model already at their disposal uh, they can just right away use it and characterize uh, or extend rft similarly when it comes to multi uh, density materials which means the dense uh, the materials which are under compacted over compacted etc in those cases there are many interesting phenomena one of the interesting phenomena that people observe is if you take the plate a normal plate and move it into the sand horizontally uh, in a loosely packed media the force response looks like this but if you take a tightly packed media often called the over compacted material uh, the the force response fluctuates between a high and low value and with our constant uh, continuum model we were able to capture this phenomena with a uh, uh, one of the models that i talked about earlier so the overall idea is if someone wants to use it in future they can just start using this model and come up with something um, and add on to the form of rft so this is almost like my last slide uh, i think um, i finished earlier uh, there are also some open source implementations of these methods uh, which you can use um, if you like to explore how these methods work and uh, use it in your research. Uh, and that would be the summary of my work that uh, RFT is increasingly becoming or evolving as a reliable tool uh, for modeling complex intrusions. Uh, and the de development of dynamic RFT and 3D RFT indicate that this RFT can really become into something which can model granular intuitions because we really don't know whether 3D RFT is going to work. So it's it's like an exploratory work. And so far, there have been like a lot of successes in this field. Uh, and with the availability of faster uh, full field numerical modeling methods, the continuum modeling that I talked about, we can uh, it's, it's relatively easy uh, to develop the form of RFT because if you do experiments, sometimes it's not possible to look at the stresses variations and strain variations and all. Uh, so that's another thing. Um, and if you think about the immediate uh, projects that can be worked on is like we have a form of 2D RFT, which means high speed uh, two dimensional RFT. And we have high uh, sorry, uh, quasi static 3D RFT. If we combine them together, we can come up with three dimensional high speed RFT. Similarly, the multi body intrusions and variable density um, intrusions are some of the things which are yet to be explored which are extremely uh, expected in real life scenarios. So if you work on them, we can come up with like even better forms of RFT. Uh, and this work was in collaboration with Professor Daniel Goldman and his student Andres Kasey in Department of Physics, uh, which have like been uh, constant um, collaborators with us for, for five years now. And uh, that would be all. I can take questions now. Hi, Shashank. Thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I think there's quite a lot of applications that we can find for this mm -hmm. research that you're doing, especially in the term mechanics field. So I think a lot of the people on, on the call now will probably have a few questions that they, they would like to ask you. And I invite those uh, participants to click on the blue share audio and video button on the right hand side of your screen. Then you can um, ask a live question if, if you would like to. Um, I myself have a few questions. So you mentioned that there's very different kinds of shapes that you can use. So can you reverse engineer the RFT method that you're, you are uh, developing here to design better wheels or, or browser concepts for uh, specifically um, land locomotion? Yes, so there is a possibility, but there are two aspects to it. When it comes to like designing objects, uh, we don't really have to do everything in real time. And we want to get a lot of data, like try to do it like sort of some optimization. So RFT is mainly focused on real time modeling of um, these kind of locomotions. So it will give you a good intuition on like what aspects uh, or what kind of angles you, you should move in the sand and all. Uh, it will give you a good intuition of like what kind of shape would work, for example, circle versus square which would be better or browser versus non browser which will be better but it's not like the right tool for doing the optimization or uh, trying to develop some better design there are better methods for example container modeling or even discrete element modeling which will give you much more accurate results and a better um, which will prove itself to be a better tool uh, when it comes to modeling uh, or designing such kind of uh, vehicles or wheels or 
whatever shapes we are trying to model. Okay, that, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, in the end of the day, you wouldn't necessarily want to be able to design something real time, but just to get an idea of if specific shapes or sizes will work, yes. this will be valuable um, application of this work. Then, also, uh, um, sorry, just sorry, just right on. No, uh, camera, there, are, camera. there are also a few things which are uh, not completely a part of RFT so far. Uh, some of them is let's say you take two plates and move them right next to each other, and now you change the distance between them. In one case, one plate is shadowed by the other one. In the other case, it's not. Right. So if you are moving horizontally, two plates are right next to each other. The second plate will not experience much force. But if you go far mm -hmm. apart, you experience both plates to experience some force. So those kind of shadowing effects are something which are yet to be explored in RFT. Like what are the limits of those things? Similarly, we use some kind of like uh, something called a leading edge hypothesis. So there are different avenues within RFT which are yet to be like figured out to like to the last extent so that we can start using those kind of optimization. So yeah, so I would say it's like far from perfect. Okay, I think I think it's it's relatively good so far. So. Don't think you have to worry too much about having it perfect for now. Um, yes. Another question that I had for you is: Do you think the the state in which your research is now, in the current form that it is now, and I I, I guess you kind of alluded to that answer just before, but do you think you can use it in any random motion or inputs uh, at various speeds, or do you think there will be a inherent um, like uh, limitation to to the the application? So I would say the current form of RFT is, as I said, like is applicable to certain scenarios as of now. For example, in 3D, it's limited to very slow motions. In high speed, mm -hmm. uh, you can go for two kind of motion, two dimensional kind of motion where we say that plane strain, the width of the object is like sufficiently large. Uh, but all of these motions are limited to media where uh, there's a constant density of the media. Media is in uniform state. If you have a media where there's pockets of like let's say loose sand, uh, high density sand, there it might not be able to work. But there are ways around to that. Like for example, if you can characterize the terrain that here the sand is loose, here the sand is uh, relatively hard uh, or tightly packed, then you can modify your inputs in that sense. But I would say it's not like a fully flesh where you can say like anything can be modeled with RFD. Uh, similarly, like high speed three dimensional motion would be difficult to model or not. Okay, um, I see in the Q&A tab, we have a question from Anonymous, and the question specifies, can you speak a little about how you field test models with such small research subjects, i.e. like very tiny grains? Uh, I don't understand the question, what exactly does it mean? Um, I think so, so the idea is that with very small granular model, um, objects so for instance very fine sand for instance mm -hmm. how how do you do the field testing of that aspect oh okay okay so uh, so we have some collaborators um, who use poppy seeds uh, for representing granular material and uh, they are basically doing the, all the experiments for us so they have like uh, um, uh, these wheels running on test rigs which are like moving in sand so that's one uh, second is uh, some of the data related to high speed intrusions of like impacting of spheres or plates into the sand uh, is available in the literature. So some of those test cases that I'm talking about are already available in the literature. And our approach is that we first verify uh, the limits of our continuum modeling. Once we verify that the continuum modeling is reliable, we go into uh, using it as the reference solution and then go about solving that. Uh, similarly, if that method is not good enough, then we can go for discrete element modeling. We can go like the particle simulations, where although they're expensive, but they are like widely accepted form of uh, granular materials. So the answer would be like uh, the doing experiments with granular materials is tough because especially because of the fact that finding forces acting on objects within the sand itself is difficult. Finding the pictures of like how the flow is happening uh, away from like let's say transparent wall on planes and conditions difficult. So we use like combination of computational methods and uh, the, the the experimentation. Um, one other question that I have for you, um, it's a little bit off topic, but it, it's still interesting for me is, what is the real time ratio that you can manage? So 
essentially how quickly can you solve for these relative to real time? Is it um, like 10% off real time or is it under real time? So uh, I would say it's nearly real time. It's nowhere near uh, real time as of now. And the reason is uh, first, uh, I'm using MATLAB for it. So the implementation is not efficient. It's like a more of a research code, which I like, I'm not doing the efficient data structures for that. So in that sense, it's not real time. But uh, I would say even it's the best form, it will not be exactly real time. It will be like of the order of, let's say, 10 times the real time. So if you are trying to simulate like a one hour simulation, maybe it will be done in 10. Uh, actually, yeah. So uh, it will it will be not be real time. Maybe I should say like five to 10 times would be a good number. But it's nowhere near the real time. OK. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw in the chat, uh, I think Ramon, uh, he mentioned that he worked alongside you um, at, at one of the labs. So I, I invite him to come on and maybe share a bit, little bit about his experience with working with you. If he is available now, that would be great. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for him, if he is going to uh, jump on the call, I see in the Q&A, Dr. Alex Keen asked the question, is RFT able to model viscous? So in other words, uh, velocity related behavior uh, that DEM empirical and analytical models do not and in real time. So I believe he's talking about mu rheology, the particle fluctuations, uh, uh, behaviors uh, that RFT is expected to show, uh, sorry, the, uh, the existing methods do not show the answer is no uh, because as i said like the rft the current form of rft that i showed you is like extremely simple it's 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 work for non coercive granular materials of particular kind when it comes to like these kind of behaviors when it comes to particle size effects or change in uh, properties of the material itself uh, it does not but at the same time one of the focus of our work is for most, most of, of the, the oh, oh, get away, get away. Hey, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm hearing an echo. echo from. Are you hearing an echo, Andres? Hello. Um, yes, I oh, think it number. might be. Number. I think it might be the Ramon's um, speaker system that just gives a little bit of feedback. Okay, now it's good. Now it's good. Ramon, uh, it was good towards the end. Okay, uh, yeah. Coming back to the uh, his question. Uh, so all these kind of uh, phenomena related to velocity fluctuations and all. Uh, current form of RFT does not have it, but. One of the focus of our work is like for most of the granular locomotion scenarios, those phenomena are not even important. For example, the wheel locomotion study that I showed you, like where slipping of wheels was happening, we we were able to uh, model the whole scenario without even considering meteorology, which is like the first thing that people might go to. So uh, in general, uh, RFT is not able to capture it, but at the same time, the fact is like often you don't even need it. So it's there's an inherent simplicity in the system, which we try to like take advantage of. I hope that answers it. OK, Ramon, if you have any questions or comments or anything, anything that you want to share, with, share us. with us. Yeah, sure. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me for asking a question. So I am very happy to see here Shashank. Uh, I met him at MIT, so he did, uh, he has already done a great job. So I'm very glad that his job is appreciated by ISTBS community. So yeah, I'm very glad. Uh, congratulations one more time, Shashan, for your work. It, it's great. Um, so I, I just want to share a little bit about our experience at, at MIT in the robotics mobility lab. Uh, especially, I remember your experiments, your, um, uh, you know, test with the test bed that we have there. Um, and uh, as you said before, uh, running all this stuff, all this uh, science in, in field tests, you know, in real conditions is a very challenging uh, point. So uh, can you talk a little bit about your experience applying your, you know, your um, contributions, uh, a little bit about the, the relationship and your experience of your contributions uh, running real tests in a test bed and, and all these kind of things? Sure, sure. Uh, uh, 
Oh, I'm again hearing an echo. echo. Okay, yes, now it's better. Uh, so before moving that, I'll just uh, mention one thing about the Alex question. I think one of the things that he mentioned was like this viscous model is about the global nature of um, granular materials, which is often observed in granular materials. Uh, for example, we have NGF models and all, which say that what is happening in the sand far away from the sand affects things happening locally. So there's a global nature to the form of RFT. The answer to that is like, no, RFT is also very local in nature. So it does not have a global nature in its current form. Um, yeah, coming back to Raman's question, um, uh, like how my experience has been. So I would say like, uh, I experienced uh, one interesting aspect of research uh, during my whole, uh, this project. Uh, as you see that this particular uh, field is uh, kind of more popular, or I should say uh, more more common or commonly studied by people who have like a physics background. So my collaborators are like from physics background. And while developing these works, it's important uh, that we uh, get on the same page, we get on uh, using the same kind of lingo. So for example, if I'm assuming something in doing some simulations, uh, it's, it has to be properly conveyed to the people. Similarly, if they are making some assumptions in the test bed, I should know it. And it's also important that we clarify that things are like this. For example, one of the things that I, uh, it's an interesting example, is that they use a test bed for uh, moving wheels in horizontal direction. And they assume that the friction in the rail is zero. And they did it by adding a counterweight to the system. So they had like a wheel rail system on which a wheel is connected. And it was like moving horizontally in forward direction. Uh, and they said like, okay, you can assume that railing, the forward force on the wheel is zero. We did that and we were unable to match their experiments. After six months of like trying where we could be wrong, we were like, what is the possibility that they are wrong and there's some friction in the system? And it came out that the friction was 0.6 instead of 0.5 that they assumed because of the dynamic friction versus kinetic friction. And when they corrected it, we were able to match the results. So in a way, it was a mistake from my side that I assumed that you know, it's, it's they said that and it has to be correct. So when it comes to computation versus experiments, it's very important that we try to make sure that everything is matching and we know their assumption and they know our assumptions. Uh, similarly, when we come up with, we were trying to come up with like form of DRFT, they came up with 10 different solutions. We come up with 10 different solutions. But at one point, um, there was like, some things which do not satisfy our assumptions and some things which do not satisfy their assumptions. So it's always like back and forth and trying to make sure that sol solution that you're coming up with more general uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, similarly, when it comes to like modeling, uh, sorry, doing experiment with granular materials, uh, it's extremely tough, which I realized after <laughs> doing some experiment by myself. Uh, for example, uh, I was doing some wheel locomotion. I was using a geared wheel, uh, uh, which has some gears and I was doing experiments with sand and sand is not the best way to do these experiments. Poppy seeds is a better option because if the grains get stuck in, in, the, in the gears, it will not move properly. So you have to use some media which can, um, which the system can deal with because if you use poppy seeds, they get crushed and the system continues to move. So those are like small, small nitty gritties that we don't experience in real life uh, or I, I should say don't experience in academic life, which, which are more important when it comes to like real life situations and all. So I would say like that has been like a fulfilling experience for me. <laughs> uh, I, I can. can I make another question, please? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Okay, so um, this is a kind of, uh, well, a kind of challenge or a kind of uh, question, personal question, if I can ask, do you think that your work could be applied in the future to design, for example, the future wheels for Mars rovers? So that's that's exact, exact, that's the exact question Andy's asked. And I was saying the exact same thing, that the form of RFT that we are talking about is meant for real-time purposes. Uh, we are time modeling of granular intrusions. It gives a real good in, uh, intuition about which kind of shapes will give maximum traction from the wheel. So for example, if you have a wheel which have like grousers inclined with respect to each other versus like uh, going um, normal to the uh, a circle, you can use RFT to know that what is the optimal angle. That's true. But when it comes to like going into finer details, like uh, what should be the thickness and all, that's where 
RFT can give you approximate answers. On the other hand, you have better ways of modeling such uh, systems, for example, let's say DEM or continuum modeling and all. Those are better ways of uh, uh, modeling such systems because there is no time constraint on modeling everything on real time. So it's a good way of developing an intuition. So if you whether you should use square wheels, circular wheels, or wheel with like flaps, which are in, in this direction versus that direction, I mean, those are like good ways. But when it comes to like real fine modeling, there are better ways to do it. And there's no need for like trying to uh, excessively use it for purposes it's not meant for. OK, thank you very much. And congratulations thanks, again, thanks. Sashank. OK, thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ramon, for your insightful questions. Um, I think it's always, think it's always interesting to, to uh, other, other people's, people's inputs. inputs. Um, are there any other questions from the audience, maybe, perhaps? Okay. Uh, I was just a uh, very trivial question. I was just... Uh, Curious, you were you quickly mentioned uh, being on the MATLAB platform as one of the causes, you know, for uh, not being so uh, so efficient. Uh, so I was wondering uh, how much uh, sticking to MATLAB was a, a constraint in your in your work. So if you were doing that as a matter of convenience, for example, because it's uh, easier to quickly get uh user interfaces graphs uh, and access of toolboxes of course or or if there is uh, some other r rationale be behind that was just curious yeah so the uh, primary reason was like uh, when we talk about rft the maximum time any simulation take in my case is like one minute uh, on the other hand like by waiting for one minute i get the advantage of uh, ease of coding as well as the interface and everything. So that was the main reason that uh, if I use MATLAB, I can just um, do everything in a very quick way. Uh, it's, it's sufficiently quick for my purposes. And second is I can make it open to the public. So with this open source app, people can directly start using it. So I feel like given that we are not currently in the industrial sector, we are not trying to um, do like real real time uh, modeling things. So it's it's okay to be slightly slow. It's it's not constraining anyone in in any sense. So in for that reason, I was like, let's continue with MATLAB and because of interface and everything. Yeah, makes makes sense. And if someone is interested in trying uh, uh, your tool, sure. do they just uh, need uh, standard um, MATLAB. basic MATLAB yes. installation? So no, no specific no. Uh, additional two boxes. No, so. Okay, well, that's... Uh, yeah, I basically use functions and uh, one or two MATLAB uh, basic algorithms, and that's it. Oh, would you maybe like to to drop into the chat uh, a link to the uh, the website of your research group where you are sharing these tools? Yeah, sure, so sure. maybe if someone is interested, they can quickly... Sure, sure, sure. sure. Uh, okay. Okay. I'll do it in a minute, yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks again. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I was having a look uh, at the chat and at the Q and A. Okay, I saw your link popping up on the uh, on the chat. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll definitely try it, even if, if if I'm not at all an expert in your in your specific field, but you know. Yeah, the idea was to just get people started. And if there are more questions, they can always uh, email me and all that. And that has been like the focus uh, of this these apps. Yeah, very good. OK. Oh, I see. OK, I see another uh, question just uh, popped up on the Q&A from Dr. Keen. So let me read it for you. So have you got? Uh, the ref. Oh, yeah, it's oh are you reading it yourself? Yeah, I'm reading it. It's like, uh, can you share the link to our? Um, oh, okay, okay. Like, sorry, yes. sorry. I, I didn't realize <laughs> he had I asked the same question. Yes. Sorry. Okay. So, okay. Nice. Uh, okay. So, or uh, 
to wrap up this uh, this session. So I would like to to thank again uh, Sashank for his presentation uh, and uh, all the staff here at ISTVS that is contributing to make uh, these events possible, and of course every one of you attending today. And I, uh, I have a couple more uh, quick things to say before before I let you go. So uh, let me uh, just get uh, reactivate my screen share. My screen share real quick. Okay. Okay. So so on. Um, on the website uh, that that you see here on the left hand side in this slide, you can find all the information uh, you need on our upcoming events in the series. So uh, schedule, speakers, registration links, they're all there. So keep an eye on it. And once again, I would like to invite uh, all the student research groups out there uh, to join us in this initiative and consider being uh, our next speakers. So if you are interested in doing so, please uh, email me at gs at istvs.org and we will do our best uh, to get you on the schedule. And finally, uh, as you know, this series uh, is our build up to the ISTVS conference and which is taking place uh, starting 12 days from now, uh, from today. So from September 27 to 29 and here on the right hand side of the slide is is our conference website so you can find all relevant information there and so keep please keep an eye on that too and now that's really it so thanks again uh, for joining us today and and see you next time goodbye everyone